ทม์ไลน์สุธิชายหยุนอาทิตย์นี้พิเศษจริงๆครับไปเจาะ e x c l u s i v e i n t e r v i e กับนายกรัฐมนตรีหลี่เสียนหลวงของสิงคโปร์ผมไปกับบรรณาธิการของ ANN Asian News Network Editors เป็นบรรณาธิการของหนังสือพิมพ์ชั้นนำในเอเชียทั้งหมด22ฉบับที่ไปจับข่าวพูดคุยหนึ่งชั่วโมงเต็มๆครับกับผู้นำสิงคโปร์คำถามมีหลากหลายมากมายทุกประเด็นโดยเฉพาะแน่นอนครับผมต้องถามว่าสิงคโปร์เข้ามองวิกฤตการเมืองของไทยอย่างไรมีผลต่ออาเซียนอย่างไรและเป็นไปได้แค่ไหนที่อาเซียนจะเป็นห่วงเป็นใยถึงขั้นจะเข้ามาร่วมกันที่จะไกลเกลียวิกฤตปัญหาในประเทศเราฟังคำตอบของลีเสียนหลงแล้วก็จะเห็นชัดเจนครับว่านี่คือผู้นำประเทศที่เป็นแกนนำหลักๆของอาเซียนไทยเราก็ครั้งหนึ่งเป็นแกนนำสำคัญของอาเซียนแต่วันนี้เขามองว่าเราเป็นคนป่วยครับนอกจากนั้นผมก็ตั้งวงสนทนาในหลายเรื่องเพราะว่าบรรณาธิการของ ANN ที่พบปะกันนั้นมาจากหลากหลายประเทศในเอเชียเลือกตั้งในอินเดียจะเป็นปรากฏการณ์สำคัญผมจึงให้บรรณาธิการของหนังสือพิมพ์ชั้นนำของอินเดียวิเคราะห์ให้ฟังจากนั้นประเด็นเรื่องหนังสือพิมพ์ในมาเลเซียเนี่ยเขาทำข่าวเรื่องเที่ยวบินปริศนา MH370 อย่างไรเบื้องหลังของการทำข่าวเรื่องนี้น่าสนใจอย่างยิ่งเพราะว่าเราอยู่ในประเทศไทยเราอยู่ต่างประเทศเราไม่ทราบหรอกครับว่าความอึดอัดปัญหาอุปสรรคของการทำหน้าที่สื่อที่ต้องติดตามข่าวที่ดังระดับโลกนั้นเนี่ยต้องเจอกับอะไรบ้างแรงกดดันมาจากรัฐบาลมีไหมและคนอ่านของเขาคนดูของเขาคนที่ติดตามข่าวคราวเขาคาดหวังอะไรและพิเศษกว่านั้นครับบรรณาธิการของจีนของเกาหลีใต้และของญี่ปุ่นมาเจอกันกับผมเนี่ยต้องตั้งวงสนทนากันทีเดียวครับว่าความขัดแย้งระหว่าง3ประเทศนี้ในกรณีทะเลจีนใต้และทะเลจีนตะวันออกจีนกับญี่ปุ่นมีปัญหากันญี่ปุ่นกับเกาหลีมีปัญหากันจีนญี่ปุ่นเกาหลีต่างคนต่างก็มีปัญหากันเนี่ยบรรณาธิการนั้นสุพิมพ์ชั้นนำสาประเทศนี้เขามองอย่างไรบ้างฉะนั้นวันนี้ครับไปเริ่มฟังจากบทสนทนากับนายกรัฐมนตรีสิงคโปร์ซึ่งปกติจะไม่ค่อยยอมตอบคำถามของสื่อมวลชนเท่าไหร่นักไปฟังว่าเมื่อบอกอระดับชั้นนำของเอเชียตั้งวงจับเขาซักถามผู้นำสิงคโปร์เกิดอะไรขึ้นที่อิสตานาทำเนียบนายกรัฐมนตรีสิงคโปร์ครับสุธิชัยยืน from nation Thailand yes. in the ASEAN context how worried are you or other ASEAN countries about the political turmoil in Thailand sir Is well, there anything ASEAN can do? It, we are concerned about it because Thailand is a very important member of ASEAN and if Thailand is preoccupied with their domestic difficulties, uh, you will not be able to contribute your full weight to ASEAN uh, endeavors and deliberations. Um, and we see this as a very difficult problem which Thailand will have, the Thai people and Thai society will have to solve. And it's not easy to do, it's a very deep problem. I don't think it is, there's very much which outsiders will be able to contribute to that, even well-meaning outsiders within ASEAN. Can ASEAN meet and discuss how to help Thailand get out of this? Well, the two sides need to want to uh, work together and get into a better position. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they lack opportunities to talk to one another. I mean, they are in the same society, in the same city. I don't think we outside of the country have either the authority or the knowledge or the influence, certainly not the power, <laughs> to, uh, to cause things to happen which the participants don't want to happen. The good intentions are there. We, we wish Thailand well because a prosperous Thailand is good, very beneficial to ASEAN. It's one of the founding members of ASEAN. Has the Thai issue, Thai problem weakened ASEAN as a whole? I think it has been I think if um, you had not had these difficulties, uh, you would have made many more contributions to what we have been working on. So what is your advice to the Thai leader? Well, I think it is not just the Thai leader, but it's really a matter for the Thai society 
to be able to find a basis on which to work which is viable over the longer term and where uh, you are one society and one country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, Thailand has always been seen to have the advantage of being the most natural nation in Southeast Asia. Natural? Natural, in a sense you have one, one uh, race, one religion, <coughs> one language, uh, one history over quite a long period of time. Singapore is very, uh, um, uh, has a very short comparison, has a very short history compared to Thailand. Mm -hmm. We are a very artificial country compared to Thailand mm -hmm. because we are multiracial, we don't have one religion, we have many religions. Mm -hmm. Our history was as a colony, was not as a, uh, as, was not as a country. So to build a nation out of these conditions is very hard, but to build a nation out of what Thailand has, well, you already have most of the pieces. Mm -hmm. But evidently there are difficulties which are uh, not easy to overcome, and we wish you all the best. In the ASEAN Charter, is there any clause that could enable ASEAN as a whole to help a particular country, member country, with this kind of domestic Conflict. I think ASEAN has succeeded because we have not interfered in one another's domestic <laughs> affairs. Pana from Thailand. Uh, when we met you about eight years ago, I think it was in your first or second year in office. Uh, at the time, Singapore was a regional city. But now, eight years later, Singapore is a world city. You're pulling away, perhaps, from the different economic standard of ASEAN. Uh, on a league of your own, in a way. Are, are there things that you have done that exceeded your expectation? There are things that you have done that you, you regret that you could have done better? Or? Well, first of all, I don't think we are pulling away from the rest of the region because we have reached a level of a more developed economy and we are growing GDP 2 3% a year if we can do well. Whereas ASEAN countries, whether it's Thailand, whether it's Malaysia, whether it's Indonesia, more so even, more so the Indochinese countries, Vietnam, Myanmar, you can make 6, 7 percent, even 8, 9, 10 percent. You are at that level. So in fact, the gap is narrowing. And your cities are able to grow very steadily and rapidly, even on, that, on top of that base, because you've got the country advancing and you are tapping on the wealth and the resources and the talent of your countries. So Bangkok, I mean, there's no reason why you should not uh, be a very, very prosperous city. It's already a prosperous city. So I don't think that we are pulling ahead from the rest of the region. What we want to do is to progress together with the region. Um, if you look back over the last decade, I think uh, overall we've done economically better than we have expected, grown faster. Um, it's partly because the winds were favorable and the markets um, were open, the investments came in. It's also partly because um, we decided that we would catch the wind when it blew and we would go with it. So we said, let's, let's, uh, let's put in the uh, the resources, let's bring in the foreign workers we need, let's grow, because tomorrow I don't know whether the opportunity will be there. Which is why today if you go around Marina South, you will see that uh, the bay is quite developed. The IR is there, the banking and financial centre is there, the other office blocks are up, there are residential buildings downtown. Uh, those are developments which we expected to take 20, 30 years to happen, but uh, within 10 years, a significant part has happened. I think that's a good part of it. Uh, unfortunately, we succeeded more than we expected. And so, in terms of the infrastructure, uh, we were not able to catch up. Our public transport, building houses, and uh, we paid a price, and we've spent the last three, four years working hard to try and come up back to speed. Uh, we've made some progress. We're not there yet, but we've made some good progress. I think in a more open environment, particularly if you call it, a, if we are uh, uh, positioning ourselves as a global city, it's very important that our people have a sense of belonging and place and of roots here, and a sense of country and community. And that's something which we are working at.
because we are a country. We're not like London or New York where you have a country and, well, London can be completely cosmopolitan, but that's quite certain you're part of England. Here we are, Singapore is part of Singapore, and that's all there is. And we have to make sure that Singaporeans feel like that and are confident of their position in this society, which they have every reason to be. Anything you regret? Well, I wish we had been able to foresee this outcome and then we would have acted sooner. <laughs> but oh, that's 2020 hindsight. And I think that that is a, it is a model which uh, has worked for us. It's a model which is changing because the internet is a very big new factor. Social media is a very big new factor. But uh, we have to, which we are struggling with. I think it's something which we have to deal with and not something where we say, well, we give up, that's the way the world is and uh, anything goes. And I, I don't, I really don't know and don't mind where the next ranking comes out for journalists. <laughs> PM, you've been quite active on social media as well. Could you just tell us a bit about that experience and if you're planning to do even more in that space? Oh. <laughs> well, it's a very interesting exercise because uh, I embarked on this about two years ago and launched a Facebook page and then later on we launched an Instagram uh, account and I'm on Twitter too, but Twitter in Singapore doesn't have very much following. So it's mainly Facebook and Instagram. Facebook has a bigger following, but Instagram has more younger people. And it's a good way to have informal comments on serious and semi-serious matters. Uh, you also have some light comments from time to time because uh, pe people like to see the human side of you and uh, it helps to build up the eyeballs. So I think uh, it's a useful additional channel but if you want to deliver an op-ed, 800 words is already too much for Facebook. And on Instagram, the passages, paragraphs are even shorter. That's just, that's just the way the attention span is. Mr. Prime Minister, I'm the only woman editor here. <laughs> so if I may close, um, you know, the era of uh, long tenorship of prime ministers seemed over, especially in this region. Dr. Mahathir has retired after 22 years, and even the CM of Sarawak has retired after 33 years. And we see change, governments changing very fast now. And you have been in power for, what, 10 years now or thereabouts? How do you see your own future? How, how long do you, you plan to stay in well, helming this I, I think that this leaders stay as long as they are able to make a contribution. If they stay beyond that, then they've overstayed their welcome. <laughs> and in Singapore, we paid a lot of attention to succession planning and making sure that we have a new team ready and new leaders able, who are capable of taking charge so that the country can move ahead and the leaders can be uh, in sync with the country. And um, I, I can't say exactly how long I'm staying, but I'm 62 years old and that's not young. <laughs> so you do have uh, a group of promising young leaders who are... Well, in the last plan. election, I brought in 20-plus new members of parliament, and several of them are in the cabinet, and they were doing well uh, and moving into more responsible positions, and I hope that they continue to do well and mature and grow in their responsibilities and in the understanding of, the, uh, of Singapore and in the acceptance of Singaporeans of their leadership. You must be quite clear what Singapore's interests are, and you must be able to persuade people that this is what we need to do together. And people have to be willing to go with you and to say, yes, I trust him, I work with him. So if you're not Prime Minister tomorrow, Singapore will still be all right? That is the objective. The social media can affect the election results in a very important way. Yes, they can. They can, because uh, it's, people exchange opinions, snippets, moods, views as much as they seek for and slowly digest news and information and judgments. And it's not, I mean, it's not the way we have been used to mm -hmm. operating in our generation, whether population or, or leadership. Because in the older generation, people would read the newspapers very seriously, cover to cover. Mm -hmm. And the Straits Times used to have an average dwell time of 45 minutes. Every day, people would 
read it quickly in the morning, put it aside in the evening, open it, and then you go through. And 45 minutes, well, you don't read everything, but you get uh, quite a good sense of what is happening. Today, I think it's down to half. Uh, it looks like we're going to have elections in Indonesia and India, two big Asian nations. And uh, the polls show that you could have uh, leaders with uh, reasonably uh, credible mandates. Does this have implications for Asia and what would they be? Well, I think it's good for Asia if the countries have a capable, responsible and uh, strongly supported leaders. Um, then you can do business, then you can uh, manage uh, regional affairs collectively and in a cooperative way. Uh, if the leaders are not strongly supported or if the leaders are weak personally, uh, then uh, you may be able to uh, have a discussion, but it may not be so easy to deal with problems. Of course, um, strong leaders also have uh, strong preferences and ideas, and it doesn't mean that we will all get together and uh, it will all be the best of all possible worlds. There will be frictions, there will be disputes, there will be difficult problems to be solved between India and China, certainly. Uh, India and Indonesia, not so likely. Indonesia and China, I think you don't have, you are not, Indian, Indonesia is not a claimant state in the South China Sea. But we, we in Singapore, we look forward to working with a strong Indonesian government, uh, one which will take an ASEAN perspective, the way the present Indonesian government has, and the way the uh, President Suharto did for many decades. And in India, we hope that the new leadership will continue to pursue cooperation with Southeast Asia and East Asia. As the previous BJP government did, the current Congress government is doing, and I hope the next government, whether Congress, BJP, or something else, will do. In China, I think uh, Xi Jinping has a very full agenda, domestically, and also internationally, uh, managing China's presence and increasing weight in the world in a way which advances China's interests, but at the same time maintains China's position as a country which, com which is a, good, a member in good standing in the community of nations. And uh, that's a very full agenda to manage. What do you or see for the ASEAN economic community in your perspective. Thank you. Uh, in the ASEAN context, we have set the, the end of 2015 as the deadline for our ASEAN, ASEAN community. I think whether it's the beginning of the year or the end of the year, it doesn't make so much difference. It's 365 days more, gives you a bit more time to work at it. But I expect that we will get most of the pieces done probably another 10-15% which we would like done, but which we will have to continue to work on beyond 2015 and into 2016. Uh, but that's the way ASEAN is. We, it's a work in progress, and when you have done some job, uh, well, new possibilities arise and new, new problems need to be solved.